Welcome everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Dr. Robert Coleman. I'm a gynecologic oncologist and the chief scientific officer for US Oncology Research here in uh, the Woodlands, Texas or Houston area. And I'm gonna be talking today about the evolving treatment strategies in newly diagnosed ovarian cancer. These are my disclosures. So if you think about ovarian cancer from across the spectrum, the natural history, you can see that uh, there's this time frame early on with symptomatology that precedes a diagnosis. Uh, usually this can be anywhere from three to six or more months, um, generally nonspecific symptoms, but ultimately a diagnosis gets made. You, and at that point, there's a decision uh, that has to be, that, that gets made as to whether or not surgery first or surgery after chemotherapy, the so-called neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you know, it would be most appropriate. But chemotherapy is then administered. Uh, there's an evaluation. And this is followed by consideration for maintenance uh, in some respects. As we'll discuss, that may be dependent on what, what was choose, chosen uh, during the chemotherapy. And then for patients, uh, for most patients, they go into this uh, progression-free interval um, of time that can vary quite a bit, uh, depending on a number of different factors. But ultimately, most patients who are diagnosed with advanced stage disease, despite good um, treatment and good response to treatment, will progress. And then they go through a series of uh, additional therapies uh, with considerations of chemo and surgery, et cetera, along the way. And what's uh, interesting is if you look at this, um, the timeframes for this, this first segment of time from the, before the initiation of, uh, of, in, of either surgery or chemotherapy to the first recurrence, we see about one to two years of time. Uh, as I mentioned, there's various different uh, factors that can influence that. But what's been remarkable has been that this time from progression on has, has actually become quite a variable zone. And you can see the medians range anywhere from 12 months to 38 months and even longer in certain subpopulations. So what we're starting to see is that the time a patient spends from uh, their first recurrence uh, on and uh, during the rest of their patient journey you know, at least rivals or exceeds the time from initial diagnosis to first recurrence. So this has been a, a new kind of uh, observation uh, that, we, that we've come to appreciate. And what's interesting too, if you look at the ovarian cancer in general, it's a, you know, considered a relatively rare tumor. In the United States, we see about 20 to 22,000 new cases a year. The mortality rate's been around um, this, uh, you know, uh, you can see here has been relatively consistent. <laughs> about uh, six to seven per uh, 100,000 women. We see about 14,000 deaths per uh, on an annual basis. But you can see that these curves are relatively parallel. It's good that they're sloping down, but they're relatively parallel. So the number, the kind of the ratio of new cases to deaths has been rate basically the same uh, since uh, uh, for, for many decades now. But what is a factor that a lot of people don't appreciate is the increasing in prevalence. Now, it's, you can see that as of 2016, 2017, we're now over 230,000 women who've had uh, the diagnosis of ovarian cancer alive at any one time in the United States. And this is important because now that we've exceeded the 200,000 benchmark, we are in a situation where this is no longer considered an orphan disease, despite the fact that there are a relatively few number of new cases. But what's really remarkable about this observation is that this rising prevalence that we see in the presence of declining incidence and parallel mortality can only mean that the patients are living a lot longer with their disease. And I think that as we review kind of like where frontline ovarian cancer is going today, you can appreciate that there's, there have been um, these new, relatively new additions to our armamentarian uh, that have probably are, are responsible for this. Now, there, it doesn't take away that surgery is getting better. More women are seeking gynecologic, gynecologic oncologists. The specialty itself is providing better um, outcomes and supportive care is obviously getting better. But what we're seeing in the backbone of just regular chemotherapy is that these adjuvants are starting to have an impact and we're keeping women alive a lot longer with their disease. Now, of these two compounds that I mentioned, an antihydrogenesis drug, particularly bevacizumab, which is now approved in the United States in four different indications, 
uh, it was first approved and in recurrent disease as in platinum resistant disease, then platinum sensitive disease. And then more recently in frontline um, newly diagnosed patients in 2018 as an adjuvant to chemotherapy. And then most recently in 2020 as a uh, maintenance therapy in combination with a labrib. Uh, the PARP inhibitors uh, have really enjoyed a, a, a very rapid rise into the armamentarian scene. And you can see that it was uh, the first drug approved in uh, germline patients, uh, excuse me, in germline, uh, uh, in women who, who carry a germline mutation in BRCA1 or 2, it was approved in 2014. And, and as uh, this space developed, we saw Recapro come in as a treatment for somatic and uh, germline uh, mutated ovarian cancers. We had the three drugs that were approved in um, as switch maintenance uh, after uh, induction response to platinum, niraparib, alaparib, recaparib. Uh, and then we had uh, the first of the frontline indications, uh, laparib in germline patients in 2018. Uh, uh, followed shortly thereafter last year with two new approvals. As I mentioned, one a laparib with bevacizumab and the second with uh, niraparib, which is also has an approval as a treatment for uh, homologous recombination deficient recurrent ovarian cancer with three or more lines of therapy. So with these um, uh, two uh, uh, major classes of drug, we've added a third, uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, which are not a common finding not specific, and these approvals are not specific to ovarian cancer, but they are um, available to ovarian cancer patients whose tumors demonstrate either MSI uh, uh, or deficient MMR or have a high TMB. Now, both of these represent relatively small cohorts of patients, but it does add to our, our, our opportunities for treatment. So when you look at this, we have four uh, different drugs approved in the um, frontline setting and nine uh, I mean, um, uh, 10 uh, drugs approved uh, or 10 indications in the recurrent setting. So, and all of these uh, have been since 2014, which is remarkable. But if you remember that curve I showed you with prevalence, there was an inflection point right around the same time. So we believe that the introduction of these uh, these targeted agents, uh, especially the PARP inhibitors, which are targeted to specific genomic aberration for which they have predictive value, um, that these are, are definitely changing the natural history of ovarian cancer. And when you think about where these drug classes fit in our armamentarian, you can see that they are now populating both frontline and recurrent, not only as concomitant agents, but also in maintenance, both in the frontline and in the uh, recurrent situations. So again, this is very much uh, uh, a important um, aspect. Now, we've, we've focused on maintenance therapy for many decades. Uh, we have tried many different compounds, most of which have not uh, risen to the status of uh, acceptable, um, I would call like standard of care th type of therapy. Uh, and, but the concept is very real. We know that patients who, uh, who undergo chemotherapy after surgery um, have very high likelihood of having no evidence of disease, at least by imaging. And if we operate on those patients, it, it, what we used to call the second look uh, procedure, either laparoscopic or uh, laparotomy, we know that um, we can find uh, disease, but even in the patients who have pathologic complete responses, 40% of those patients will recur in the next two years. So there's something about this disease that either uh, arises from a stem population that is not identifiable, or we just miss very small volume disease. And so the concept here is that if we could find something that would kill off these remaining cells, these patients would not go into relapse, but instead would go on to um, at least a, an enduring uh, uh, lasting a remission or ultimately to a cure. And that's really the focus for why maintenance therapy was so well investigated. Now, as I mentioned, we'd had a number of drugs that failed along the, along the path. Um, many of these were um, uh, non-specific biological uh, uh, chemotherapy type agents or uh, uh, immune targeted agents or even radiation therapy. It really wasn't until bevacizumab came on the scene uh, in this uh, publication in 2011, along with ICON-7 that started to look at a way to extend the time to first recurrence. So this was GOG-218, which was focused initially on suboptimal patients and then was broadened in its eligibility to optimal uh, um, macroscopic uh, disease patients randomized uh, uh, to one of three arms. 
Uh, two of these arms included bevacizumab during chemotherapy, and one of them included bevacizumab as a maintenance strategy. This was a placebo-controlled uh, uh, trial. The second trial, as I mentioned, was ICON-7. It was similar in design. It did not have a third arm, uh, the concomitant uh, chemotherapy uh, followed by placebo, um, but it did have two arms, one looking at chemotherapy, one looking at chemotherapy plus BEV followed by BEV maintenance, although the doses were a little reduced um, and the patient population was a little different. These, both of these trials did demonstrate a consistent effect, both of them improving progression-free survival. In GOG-218, uh, we saw about a 37% reduction in the risk in the hazard for uh, progression or death. In ICON-7, we saw about a 13% about a reduction in, in the um, uh, hazard for progression or death. And both of these curves have this curious kind of split where um, we see an effect that's largely a, a present during the exposure, but once the exposure has been discontinued, uh, these curves come back together uh, kind of in a banana shape. Now, however, these, these drugs did uh, uh, look at some cohorts, and again, these are hypotheses, um, generating exercises, and they're not quite exactly the same, but in GSG-218, uh, it, was, it was identified that patients with stage four disease appear to have a survival um, uh, benefit compared to the rest of the cohorts. And in uh, ICON-7, there was a quote unquote high risk cohort, which included stage three suboptimals and stage four patients. And you can see again, uh, there was this suggestion of an improvement in overall survival for this, for this cohort. Now, these became very important from a regulatory standpoint in Europe and in many other countries because bevacizumab is now restricted in, in, into these particular sits, uh, situations. Um, and uh, th uh, this has also percolated even into the US market. So when you look at these um, at 218, uh, and I'll come back to this slide in a little bit, you can see that among the three arms, the progression-free survival was improved by about four months at the median uh, for this particular drug. Now, I mentioned the other major uh, development was uh, the PARP inhibitors. Uh, we've known for a fairly long time, this is a paper from 2012, that showed that patients who carry a mutation uh, in BRC1 or 2 uh, had a prognostic, uh, uh, were prognostically uh, more favorable than those patients that were considered non-carriers. So this uh, demonstrated a prognostic uh, implication of this particular uh, mutation alteration. Now we know now we know now uh, that this is probably linked to the heightened responsiveness of, of patients uh, whose tumors are deficient in homologous combination to um, platinum agents. But it was uh, and and this was uh, something that was well known. However, it wasn't until we understood the uh, the vulnerability of particular. Uh, tumors that um, lack compliance in the homologous recombination pathway, that these drugs may actually have uh, even a greater, that there may be an actual class of drugs that could provide even a, a greater impact. And so this is from uh, the um, uh, exploration of the genomic alterations of high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And you can see that about almost half of these tumors have some type of alteration in the homologous recombination gene pathways with BRCA1 and 2 being the the biggest component of that, but a number of other genes uh, um, and alterations are, 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 are felt to be potentially uh, uh, targetable under, um, under therapies that, that leverage this, um, this particular uh, pathway's uh, aberration. The other um, identification, <clears throat> uh, what we call the genomic scar, was also found uh, as a way to reflect these tumors. We know that patients that have tumors that are deficient in BRCA accumulate um, uh, uh, alterations across the genome. Uh, these can be measured by the uh, prediction of loss of heterozygosity throughout the genome. And there are tumors that are wild type for BRCA, but have the same kind of signature. We call that, uh, and they may have a high lo loss of heterozygosity, we call that a BRCA-like signature. So it occurs in the presence of wild type uh, uh, BRCA. And these can be differentially identified from those patients that have wild type uh, genomic alteration, but uh, do not have a high level of loss of heterozygosity. And these became important because we realized that um, if we if we looked at the BRCA mutation population, uh, which you know rep could represent between um, 15 and 20 percent or so, uh, and then look at the patient population that was wild type for that but had these alterations, 
we got about 50% of our patient population to have these alterations. And the thought was, is that these may be candidates for drugs that target this alteration or target this pathway. So in came the idea of PARP inhibitors. Um, PARP is, a, uh, is a, uh, pr a protein that's responsible for repair of single strand DNA uh, breaks. When it is inhibited, uh, these or trapped onto the uh, pharmacologically onto the DNA, these um, replicating cells are more likely uh, statistically to perform to form uh, double strand breaks. Now, under normal conditions, uh, this particular defect can be fixed by the process of homologous recombination. And this banks on the fact that there is a normal uh, chromatid that has been silenced that can be used as a reading frame to develop uh, a, a single strand uh, sequence that can then be um, uh, repaired uh, by base pair, um, uh, uh, by base excision repair process. But in a cell that has a deficiency of that process, those cells develop uh, mitotic catastrophe and ultimately die. So you can see that the inhibition of a PARP inhibitor re re requires or relies on the statistical probability that homologous recombination is either absent or inefficient for it to actually induce a cell death. So it's kind of like a, what we call a synthetic lethal or a, um, a synthetic sickness that a cell may have that can't survive a PARP inhibition. Now there've been multiple trials, as I mentioned, uh, this demonstration of, uh, of, of effect um, seen in the um, recurrent setting uh, as a direct therapy, we've seen it in switch maintenance, and then this ultimately ended up into the frontline setting. And there are now four trials that are evaluating the role of PARP inhibitors in uh, primary uh, treatment for uh, ovarian cancer. The first, as I mentioned, was SOLA1, which was looking at a germline mutation in BRC1 and 2, but you can see Prima, Paola1, and Velia were all uh, trials that were looking at the role of a PARP inhibitor, Alaparib, Neraparib, Alaparib, and Viliparib, uh, uh, as a, uh, a therapy for patients with um, um, ovarian cancer. All of these trials, uh, with the exception of Velia, used a unbalanced randomization. Velia would be in a three-arm trial that started the uh, PARP inhibitor of Viliparib during chemotherapy in uh, two of the arms, and then one of the arms uh, it, in, it extended Viliparib in the maintenance, very similar to the GOG218 design. You can see that for three of these trials, the uh, exposure of uh, duration was up, was two years, up to two years, with the exception of Prima, which allowed for up to three years of, of PARP exposure. The patient populations were slightly different. As I mentioned in uh, SOLA1, this was all a BRCA1 uh, and 2 mutated tumor population, largely defined by germline. In Prima, it allowed for patients who had stage three visible residual disease Patients with stage four, it allowed for neoadjuvant chemotherapy patients, but they had to demonstrate a response to platinum and pactaxol. PALA1 uh, was a trial that uh, was also demanding uh, that uh, patients, if they had residual disease, had to demonstrate a response, but these patients had to have started on bevacizumab during treatment, and then they were randomized two to one to the addition of Olaparib versus placebo. And Velia was a trial that actually did its randomization at the time of the initiation of chemotherapy. And this uh, included patients who uh, could receive, um, were either stage three or four, optimal or suboptimal, also allowed for new adjuvant chemotherapy. And all they had to have was no progression uh, at the time of uh, the initiation of the uh, maintenance arm of the trial. So slightly different. The proportion of patients with stage four was greatest in Prima and lowest in Solo One, uh, but you can see the spectrum there. The proportion of patients that had primary debulking surgery versus new adjuvant chemotherapy, relatively consistent among the trials, is a uh, higher degree of new adjuvant chemotherapy in the PALA One trial. And the assay for, for understanding the um, uh, homologous recombination deficiency, uh, in, obviously in Solo One, it was all due to germline uh, mutation, so this was a mutational sequence. But HRD testing uh, was done in the three other trials in Prima and uh, PALA1, both using the same um, uh, cutoff uh, for the score uh, at, 30, at 42. And then Velia had a differential uh, cutoff at 33, which was uh, said to be informed by the growing body of evidence for HRD testing. The primary endpoints were largely the same. Uh, um, they all used progression-free survival, but Prima, uh, uh, similar to its uh, to Neraparib's uh, evaluation in the recurrent setting used a blinded independent central review to assess uh, progression-free survival. 
uh, the others uh, were all assessed by, um, uh, by uh, the investigator. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is that two of these trials did have hierarchical testing, so that they initially evaluated uh, a uh, annotated population for Prima, it was the HRD patient population, and for Velia, it was the BRCA mutation population. Uh, Prima stepped down if that was positive to the intent to treat, uh, whereas Velia stepped down to an HRD population, which included the BRCA mutation population, and then third step in that process was the, uh, the intent to treat. So I mentioned, I showed you this before with uh, uh, GOG218 down here at the bottom, and you can see the impact of these other trials uh, by these annotated populations. So if you look at them in the, uh, those that are, are tr being treated with a PARP inhibitor in patient populations that we think the PARP inhibitor would work, so this would be BRCA mutated cancers or those that have HRD, you can see there's this very, very strong effect, uh, which is uh, reflecting the uh, predictive value of, of these particular biomarkers for efficacy on a PARP inhibitor or a PARP combination, uh, which are shown here on this slide. So let me walk you quickly through these trials and their results. SOLA1 uh, was initially presented in 2018 and published shortly thereafter, uh, which was looking at uh, Alapra versus placebo in patients who had responded uh, to uh, their induction therapy and carried a germline or somatic mutation in BRCA. The primary endpoint was an investigator-assessed progression-free survival with a number of secondary endpoints. At the initial report, uh, you can see the median progression-free survival hadn't been met, but the hazard ratio uh, reflecting the uh, reduction in the hazard for progression or death was, uh, was 0 0.3, uh, highly statistically significant. Um, at the uh, ESMO meeting, this was followed up uh, by two more years of follow-up, and you can see now the curves have now crossed the median with, you can see, with a dramatic increase in the median for HP survival of 56 months versus 13.8, maintaining the hazard ratio of 0 0.33. But I think what's most remarkable about this particular um, study is that this morphology of the curves after the treatment cap, you can see there's uh, the two-year treatment cap that at that point, you can see there was about 74% of the patients that had progressed versus 35, uh, that had not progressed versus about 35% uh, in the control arm. But that proportion stays throughout the rest of this post-treatment duration. So unlike bevacizumab where those curves collapsed, here they stay apart. And what's really remarkable to me and exciting is that now that we're out at five years, half of these patients essentially have not recurred at five years from their, uh, uh, from their uh, uh, maintenance um, it, uh, initiation. So our hope is that this actually may translate into a real cure population. Prima, as I mentioned, was a higher risk patient population, again, two to one. Uh, its primary endpoint was the progression free survival by uh, blind independent review. Now, this trial also evaluated a weights and plates uh, design to looking at individualized dosing. Uh, at this point, looking at uh, weights over 77 kilograms, uh, and platelets uh, over 150 at the standard 300 milligram dose with those without that were reduced to 200 uh, milligrams. And as I mentioned, this was a hierarchical test. So here was the initial um, evaluation in the HR deficient population. Again, has a ratio of 0.43, a very strong effect, uh, over doubling the, at the median um, and uh, demonstrating a very, as I mentioned, a very strong uh, treatment effect uh, for uh, this population. When it was stepped down to the intent to treat population, you can see that um, uh, this was still statistically significant with an improvement of about five months at the median, but a hazard ratio uh, that reflects about a 38% reduction in the hazard for progression or death at every step along this, um, this follow-up uh, curve. So again, a very strong effect. PALA1 was, a, was a, a, as a trial, as I mentioned, was looking at the uh, cohort of patients with advanced stage disease who were already on bevacizumab. If they uh, had evidence of a response or no progression, uh, they were then randomized to the addition uh, two to one of Olaparib versus placebo. So very similar to the, to the SOLA1 design uh, with the exception uh, that these patients all had a start on bevacizumab and there was no um, restriction on just germline uh, annotation. Primary endpoint was assessed by the investigator and the primary endpoint of this trial was the intent to treat population. And you can see in this all comer population, there was an improvement of about six months at the median with a hazard ratio of 0.59. Again, a very strong treatment effect. Now, 
although these are hypothesis generating, um, I, I'm showing you these subgroup analyses because they did uh, inform the ultimate um, approval of this combination in the United States and now many other countries, most recently in Japan. But you can see here, if you look at just the HRD positive, which included the uh, tumor BRCA population, again, a very strong treatment effect, uh, has ratio about 0.33. If you look at the patients who did not have BRCA, but just had this HRD, again, a very, what we would consider to be a, um, a strong sensitivity signal, given that we know that PARP inhibitors work in this category of patients, uh, has ratio of 0.43. But what was really um, uh, uh, interesting was that in the patient population that was not um, annotated by these two biomarkers, again, this is bevacizumab, uh, or bevacizumab elaprib. So we have an active control arm here. We have a hazard ratio of 0.92. Uh, and this was felt to be uh, substantially negative enough, though, though even though it was not a hypothesis a tested endpoint uh, in the initial study design, it was felt that this group of patient was probably not benefiting and they limited the, the um, uh, approval for um, a lap or bevacizumab to just the patient population who was HRD positive, which is this uh, curve over here. Now the second, um, I'm showing you this as well because this is a, uh, a step-down analysis uh, that was pre-specified in the PALA trial, which is PFS2. This is the time to second progression. And you can see these curves essentially are very flat um, against each other, but then start to separate around two years. Hazard ratio is 0.78 because this is a fully tested, hypothesis tested endpoint. The p-value is at 0 0.125. It is statistically significant, meaning the second, it's second endpoint. Uh, again, this is also in the intent to treat population. So we'll see where this goes. This has been used as a, a surrogate for overall survival. Um, so we'll have to just see how um, ultimately these uh, pan out over time. So the question is, what do you do with all this? So we have a we have a we have positive results in annotated population. We have we have two drugs. Uh, one in all comers, uh, the antiandrogenous drugs, we've got one that combines them with the uh, PARP inhibitor and one where the PARP inhibitors seem to be very strong. So I'm gonna walk you through how I think most of us now look at this, um, uh, for, as, particularly as it relates to how the guidelines are being constructed. So if you, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this in reference to the NCCN guidelines, um, uh, which uh, came out around the time, uh, actually just before we had full uh, evaluation and approvals of all of these drugs that I've mentioned, but I think that the split here uh, does provide uh, some information about how you could uh, potentially approach a patient. And now, I'm, and I'm, I want to uh, uh, caveat my my comments that this really only applies if you have all of the options available. In other words, you have germline testing and somatic testing, you do have HRD testing, and you do have uh, uh, the ability to uh, give. Bevacizumab and Alaparib is a combination because it's approved, and Alaparib is approved in all in all uh, in all situations. Okay, so let me start with this. So here you have on the left hand side you have a, a patient, advanced stage patient, uh, who uh, has had um, surgery, and you've elected because of uh, at least you have to make your first decision as to whether or not the patient should have Bevacizumab as part of their primary therapy. So that has to be your first discriminator. Now, if you are a person who feels that the patient is not going to benefit from bevacizumab or you don't believe that bevacizumab is actually important, then the next step in your decision pathway is to understand how much you can, you can learn from the tumor itself. And certainly BRCA testing in the germline is now pretty much available in most parts of the world. Um, but if you have the ability to also uh, obtain data from the somat from the tumor tissue, you would be able to add another five to eight percent uh, of patients who would be uh, classified as a as a tumor that has a BRCA one or two mutation. Now, if the patient is wild type for BRCA and they have uh, enjoyed a remission uh, to their uh, therapy, your ops your op um, op uh, uh, your opportunities are to either observe that patient because this is, remember, this is a BRC wild type patient. You can use niraparib because niraparib is approved regardless of the biomarker status. Uh, and, um, and these would be uh, uh, you know, reasonable choices uh, for this patient population. 
Now, if the patient, if you're, if you decided not to use bevacizumab, but the patient carries a germline or somatic mutation and has responded to treatment, then you actually have multiple object, multiple choices. One, you could still observe that patient, but we have very good data from both uh, Prima and from Solo One that these patients would benefit um, substantially by the use of a PARP inhibitor, and both the PARP inhibitors are approved in this situation, uh, both Olaparib and Norepirib. Now, on the other hand, if you feel that a patient is a good candidate for bevacizumab, uh, or you believe that bevacizumab adds to this patient population, you have the same uh, split in your decision making. So after you've decided to use bevacizumab, the next step is to understand the patient's uh, uh, tumor. Now, if you have data from uh, the germline uh, and the tumor tissue, then you um, can observe what those uh, patients' um, outcome uh, that they have to this. And if they are known to be wild type, uh, but you've already started bevacizumab, then your options at that point are to uh, use uh, 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 bevacizumab and continue it on if they are uh, uh, HR proficient. But if you have HRD testing and that HRD testing demonstrates that it is positive, then a lab for bevacizumab is indicated. If the patients have a germline mutation and you've started a bevacizumab, then you have a number of choices. One is that you can add a lapra because it's indicated in that patient population. But there are patients, uh, at least it would be a, an option to consider uh, that you could add a lapra, uh, uh, or you could stop the bevacizumab and treat on in maintenance with lapra or norapra. Um, generally, I'm not a big fan of this because you've already taken all the risk for starting bevacizumab, but if the patient wants to stop the IV therapy, these would be reasonable alternatives. And so if you put this all together, you get this major uh, curve or algorithm. So where do we go from here? Well, you know, it's, you know, there's lots of interesting ideas moving forward. Um, obviously, there's been uh, quite a bit of interest at looking at immune therapy. Unfortunately, we have had uh, two major failures uh, looking at, at this uh, in the front line with, uh, uh, with the Velimab and the Javelin 100 trial. Uh, and most recently with GOG uh, 3015 and Imagine 50, which uh, looked at Tezo, Lizumab and Bevacizumab, which failed. Uh, we do have um, evidence uh, that chemotherapy and a PARP inhibitor can be given, but it's, uh, you know, how, how much of an impact it, that is actually gained during the chemotherapy is still to be identified. And there is a, a, a strong, I think, unmet medical need for how do we best approach patients with HR proficient tumors. Uh, definitely have the opportunity to use uh, bevacizumab and rapirib in this situation, but the benefit in these patient populations is relatively modest and would represent a nice area to go forward. Now, to do that, uh, there's been a lot of interest in wanting to focus in these areas. I'm just going to show you one study, Mediola. This was a trial that we learned um, had activity in patients that carried um, a germline mutation, but most recently, uh, we were uh, given uh, data uh, in the wild type cohorts. Uh, and you can see that both the doublet of Olaparib and the immune checkpoint their value map, or the uh, triplet in combining it with bevacizumab uh, was given in this, in this group of patients to look for outcomes. And what we saw was that if you can just see kind of the density of the, of the arrows, that patients uh, uh, who got the triplet seemed to respond at a higher rate and, the, and they had uh, a longer progression-free survival and disease control rate very impressive numbers here. Uh, you can see with the addition of bevacizumab. Remember, these are patients who, uh, who had uh, wild type for, for BRCA. But you say, well, wait a minute. You know, these patients could have had um, uh, homologous recombination, but were, G were BRCA wild type. And that's true. So they also looked at those that had genomic instability. And they looked at this genomic instability um, fat, uh, uh, curves uh, in the cohorts for which they had information. And you can see that I've highlighted down here in the, uh, in the um, genomic instability negative cohort. So these would be the HRD test negative patients that this triplet uh, induced 75% response. Now it's only eight patients, so I don't get too excited. But that is a very impressive um, outcome uh, with the addition of bevacizumab. So there may be something about this triplet that is gonna be uh, helpful to us in that HR uh, proficient patient population. And, and fortunately, we have uh, a number of trials that are gonna be evaluating that. So we have four trials right now uh, that are uh, either completed enrollment or um, uh, nearly completing enrollment. 
that are evaluating uh, these uh, three uh, classes of drugs, angiogenesis, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and PERP inhibitors. And you can see them here. So first, OB43, duo O, or OB46, and Athena are all looking at uh, these uh, particular uh, um, agents uh, in com various different combinations, hopefully to uh, expand uh, in the spaces where uh, we definitely see an unmet medical need. So to take home points, uh, in the past decade, we've seen this prevalence um, increasing. We think this is um, happening uh, with respect to the introduction of PARP inhibitors and bevacizumab more, more um, prolifically in the uh, first in the recurrent space, but also now in the frontline space. And this is impressive because we've seen this despite the fact that there's been de declining incidence with a parallel uh, rate of uh, declining mortality. Uh, we think that uh, the the diagnostic and therapeutic value for uh, genomic testing um, uh, uh, based on genomic testing for PARP inhibitors is now essential and should be uh, uh, generalized, uh, we think, for the, for the ovarian cancer patient population. Um, and as we start to look at how we uh, change our approach to this disease, you can see how the uh, different treatment algorithms are being built based on the type of information and the approvals that are available. And we're very hopeful that in the future, we'll see these new therapies emerge with uh, additional combinations that will uh, take advantage of these most difficult area to treat, which would be the homologous recombination proficient or test negative patients, uh, um, uh, tumors in, in patients uh, that have um, uh, primary ovarian cancer. Again, thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll close here. Thank you.